Welcome to SCOTUS Cast, Cross Border Shooting Edition. Thank you for tuning in. On February 21st, 2017, the Supreme Court heard oral argument in Hernandez v. Mesa. In 2010, Sergio Adrian Hernandez Guareca, a 15 year old Mexican national, died after being shot near the border between El Paso, Texas, and Juarez, Mexico by Jesus Mesa Jr., a U.S. Border Patrol agent. Hernandez's parents, who contend that their son was on Mexican soil at the time of the shooting, sued Mesa in federal district court in Texas, alleging violations of the Fourth and Fifth Amendments. After hearing the case en banc, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit ultimately ruled in favor of Mesa, concluding that Hernandez could not assert a Fourth Amendment claim and that Mesa was entitled to qualified immunity on the parents' Fifth Amendment claim. There are three questions now before the Supreme Court. One, whether a formalist or functionalist analysis governs the extraterritorial application of the Fourth Amendment's prohibition on unjustified deadly force as applied to a cross-border shooting of an unarmed Mexican citizen in an enclosed area controlled by the United States. Two, whether qualified immunity may be granted or denied based on facts, such as the victim's legal status, unknown to the officer at the time of the incident. And three, whether the claim in this case may be asserted under Bivens v. Six Unknown Federal Narcotics Agents. To discuss the case, we have Stephen Geyer, who is Senior Counsel for the House Committee on Homeland Security. As always, the Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. And now, Mr. Geyer. It's uh, important to note at the beginning here that the facts are in dispute. But this is a motion to dismiss, and so we have to go with the facts as alleged in the complaint. And so they are. uh, That in uh, 2011, I believe, 15-year-old Sergio Hernandez was playing with a friend in a concrete culvert between El Paso, Texas, and uh, Ciudad Juarez in Mexico. And I'm going to spend a couple minutes here talking about this this culvert because it came up a lot in oral argument. It's sort of important for everybody to sort of understand what it is. So if you would imagine that between El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, there is this concrete you know, you know strip going you know north to south, and it, uh, to the uh, I guess to the east of the of this concrete strip of land is a fence that is on the uh, on the United States side, and to the west is another fence that is on the Mexican side. The official border of the United States and Mexico of the United States and Mexico is right down the middle of the culvert, although there is no you know painted line or, or chalked line that says U.S. Mexico. And running perpendicular to this culvert is a elevated uh, rail bridge, and there are pillars from the rail bridge that go down into the culvert. This culvert, concrete culvert, is jointly uh, operated and maintained and repaired by the United States and Mexico, both pitch in uh, money to, to, to do that. So if you can imagine that, the story is, the alleged fact is that uh, 15-year-old Sergio Hernandez was playing with friends. Apparently they were playing a game where they would run up to the United States side, touch the fence, and run back. At one point, uh, Agent Mesa uh, grabbed uh, Hernandez's friend, apparently by the collar, in U.S. territory. Hernandez himself ran back into Mexican territory, uh, hid behind one of the pillars from the rail bridge going into the culvert. He was uh, at that time shot and killed by Agent Hernandez. DOJ and DHS investigated the incident, and they did not bring criminal charges against Agent Mesa. Hernandez's parents sued in federal district court in Texas, both statutorily and constitutionally, and to keep the procedural stuff brief, I'll, I'll just say that at district court level, all the counts were dismissed. The Hernandez's appealed to the Fifth Circuit only on the constitutional grounds. The Fifth Circuit originally said that the Fourth Amendment claims were blocked, were dismissed, but the Fifth Amendment claims could go forward under the recent 2008 decision, uh, Boumediene. The Fifth Circuit then granted a rehearing of the case in Banque. Fifteen judges participated. They issued a per curiam decision where they said there was no Fourth Amendment claim here and that they were divided on whether or not there was a Fifth Amendment claim, but Agent Mesa was entitled to qualified immunity, and so the motion to dismiss was granted. The Hernandez then petitioned to the Supreme Court. The petition languished very long at the Supreme Court, uh, about a year and a half, from July 2015 to October 2016. At that point, the court did grant cert, obviously, and they granted the the two questions that Hernandez uh, presented. Uh, The first one was, does a functional or formalist uh, analysis govern the extraterritorial application of the Fourth Amendment's prohibition on unjustified deadly force as applied to the facts of this case? So we're asking, does the the Verdugo case uh, apply here, or does the Boumediene case apply here? 
and then they also grant and assert and may qualified immunity be granted or denied based on facts such as the victim's legal status that were unknown to the officer at the time of the shooting. Now, the court also added uh, on its own a third question, which was, can a Bivens claim be asserted under this, uh, under uh, the facts of, the, of, this, of this case? Uh, we will get to Bivens in, in a second here. First, I'm going to talk about the extraterritoriality stuff and what happened in the court here. Just beginning, I got to sort of break it down as, as what I saw. First, Chief Justice uh, Roberts and Justice Alito clearly were not uh, on the side of applying the Fourth Amendment in the context of this case. Justice Ginsburg clearly was. And then he had a couple uh, justices, uh, uh, namely uh, Justice Breyer and Justice Kagan, who seemed open to the idea of applying uh, the Fourth Amendment, but not without some sort of properly tailored rule that they could uh, use in, in additional cases, uh, a rule that wasn't so narrowly limited to the facts of this case. So it wasn't just, you know, uh, okay, you win, congratulations, done. But also they didn't want uh, someone that was something that was so broad that would cause confusion within the agencies, within the, uh, the lower courts. So what was the rule that the petitioners tried to put forward to the court? And, and as best as I could piece together, this is what it was. They said the Fourth Amendment's constraints can apply when, number one, there's a cross-border shooting, Two, that shooting is by a federal civilian law enforcement or officer. Three, the officer is on U.S. soil. And four, the resulting injury is on the other side of the border but is in close proximity. Now, under questioning from Justice Alito, the petitioner's lawyer, uh, Hernandez's lawyers, uh, lawyers seem to add a couple additional prongs, maybe impliedly, maybe not. But he also said something about if the victim is unarmed and if the victim may have been injured in this concrete culvert or something similar. There was, he, he, he kept on going back to, you know, I would urge the justices to take a look at the, at the concrete culvert. It's a very unique situation, uh, uh, whatnot. But it, it wasn't 100% clear if he was trying to even limit it, that, uh, even limit it more than beyond just the quote-unquote close proximity. So this obviously frustrated uh, just Chief Justice Roberts very, uh, very much, uh, and of Justice Alito, as I, as I mentioned. Justice Roberts jokingly said, well, that's very convenient because it matches the exact facts of, of your case. Justice uh, Alito said, look, the court needs to devise a rule to apply to other cases, and right now the only rule that you seem to be telling me is uh, you win. And Breyer was, in my judgment, struggling with this as well. He was going back and forth a lot with uh, Hernandez's attorney about, to almost quote him exactly, he was saying, tell me what words we need to use that we can write down an opinion that would uh, allow you to win, because that's what you want, but then also you know, make it easier for the lower courts, not cause great confusion in other departments within DHS, within DOD. There was a lot of talk about drones here, about how uh, they don't... Uh, they don't want to uh, 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 um, uh, create a rule, a rule so broad that they might, you know, uh, cause a drone pilot in Nevada who is uh, carrying out an attack in, in Iraq to to be sued in federal court. Justice Kagan sort of accepted that the rule was articulated, but but then said, okay, but what is the reasoning for the rule? Tell me, tell me the the why, if you will. I, I get what, what you're saying, but why? Give me some reason behind it. And he, uh, the petitioner's lawyer said, well, it's because we have a, pro- a problem on the southwest border with with uh, cross-border shootings, and he said that the border is a very unique place. And at this point, it sort of confused me, and it's odd because he made a, a uh, the petitioner's lawyer, Hernandez's lawyer, made a statement that the Border Patrol is 44,000 agents strong on the southwest border, and they interact with uh, only with Mexican nationals. And, and I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to you know cause any disrespect to the man or anything like that, but, that, but both those statements are just not true. Uh, the Border Patrol, north border and southern border, put together is just shy of 20,000 agents. I'm not sure what the 44,000 came from, and they most certainly do not only act interact with Mexican nationals. There are segments along the border where a majority of the flow these days is Central American uh, individuals, not Mexican. But anyway, that aside, that's sort of where things were left with, with the petitioner and the back and forth with the justices, trying to identify some sort of rule. Now, Agent, Agent Mesa's attorney was nothing if not consistent. He was you know, very strongly maintained that the border is finite, it is not elastic, and the Fourth Amendment constitutional, constitutional protections end there. Borders have, or excuse me, wars have been fought over borders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he and the government took the uh, exact position, and that was that Verdugo established a rule that the Fourth Amendment does not apply to some mass of persons outside the United, the United States, and Boumediene did, uh, did nothing to change that. He made the point that... Uh, the control over the cul- this culvert, this uh, cement culvert, is so small in comparison to the uh, control that the United States has over Gitmo, obviously going back to Boumediene. So presumably he was saying that if 
even uh, Boumediene were to apply in this situation, uh, the same res- it would be the same result and that the Fourth Amendment didn't apply because there, there's just not much control. So <clears throat> to touch upon this control argument a little bit as well, because it came up uh, uh, in other other um, areas of, of oral arguments, it was weird because um, there was there was talk about control over the culvert, but in a very different sort of context. The petitioner, uh, uh, the Hernandez uh, lawyer, <clears throat> he relied on congressional testimony from uh, Border Patrol, former Border Patrol chief Mike Fisher from 2011, that said talked about the Border Patrol's authority projecting outward from the border and, and into Mexico. Uh, that was congressional testimony, which in, in all transparency was a, a, a committee hearing that was before the committee that I work on, and I was president at this at this hearing. And it's it, this this quote of Chief Fisher's has been used in uh, border litigation, not just in, in the Mesa case, but also out in Arizona uh, as well. It's, uh, it's slightly out of context. I don't quite agree with it being used the way they're trying to agree, agree uh, they're trying to use it in, in litigation context. But nonetheless, that is what they were trying to say was that the border patrol, it, it, the border patrol is so unique and the border is so unique that they project this authority outward. Justice Breyer kept up bringing the fact that this culvert is operated, and maintained, and repaired jointly by the U.S. and Mexico. And so maybe, you know, I, certainly that's that he fully said that's not as much. Uh, control as there was in Gitmo, but you know maybe it's enough uh, under Boumediene to uh, to uh, have the Fourth Amendment attached. So where does that leave us with uh, extraterritoriality? Well, I said two justices, Alito and Roberts, uh, were pretty firmly no. Uh, Ginsburg was a yes, and then two were sort of well maybe, but you know you, we need some sort of rule, and I wasn't quite sure, was quite uh, um, uh, 100% sure if a um, a rule, a proper rule, was was um, was put forth. Two justices uh, uh, really didn't say much about extraterritoriality, and notably, one of them was Justice Kennedy. Obviously, the commentary going in here was that all eyes was on, uh, were going to be on Kennedy because he wrote the opinion in Boumediene. He had an occurrence opinion in uh, Verdugo. He did not say much at all about uh, about either case uh, or which way he might be uh, might be leaning there. He pretty much just stuck to the Bivens arguments which I'll get to in a second here. One thing I wanted to say was that sort of uh, the court seemed to be operating at the extremes when we were talking about uh, extraterritoriality, the Fourth Amendment stuff, which was sort of frustrating to me because they were pretty much just saying, okay, well, we don't want to have such a narrow, narrow rule that just is uh, confined to the facts of this case. But then on the same time, then on the other hand, I should say, um, they were saying, well, we, but we don't want to, you know, affect drone pilots. It, it was, that, that was pretty much the only other context that they sort of tried to compare it to, which, um, it was, again, was frustrating for me because I think we need to think of it in, in other terms besides just drones uh, or military application. We need to think about it in another other context of the southern border itself, where there isn't a concrete culvert, where there isn't such an area of land that is jointly operated. Uh, by the U.S. and Mexico, where there is just a, a, a sort of line in the sand, if you will, such as a, where it places in Arizona. What about the maritime environment? What about the maritime border? What about Coast Guard operations on the West Coast, more in Alaska, et cetera? How would, how would such a rule, uh, if accepted, be applied uh, in different areas uh, along the border and not you know, excluding the, the military application, uh, if, uh, if, you, if you will? Okay, so Bivens. Uh, remember that the court added this question, the Vivens question itself. This was not part of the original questions presented. And the the government seemed to sort of take that hint, and they spent a majority of their written brief and a vast majority of their time at oral, oral arguments talking about uh, the Vivens issue. Uh, they, uh, the government uh, labeled the Vivens issue the quote-unquote antecedent question of the case. That, one commentator said that all eyes were on the Vivens uh, issue in this case, and, that, and that's, that's, I, I don't, don't, don't disagree with that at all. On uh, this issue, there was a much more clearly defined split, uh, as, as far as I can tell. It's sort of breaking into two camps. One was sort of led by Justice Kagan, and, it, and their argument was, look, in this case, it is either Bivens or nothing. There is no statutory remedy. There's no administrative remedy. Uh, they did not uh, uh, bring murder charges or any other sort of uh, criminal charges against Agent Mesa. So if we say no to Bivens, we're, we're just cutting them off. The other camp uh, was saying, uh, look, in Bivens, we look for special factors, and the ultimate special factor is foreign affairs, foreign relations, and by virtue of this being on the border, 
uh, by virtue of this being a cross-border shooting, that this is a foreign relations case, foreign affairs case, and we need to leave it to the political branch. Now, unfortunately for uh, the petitioner, for uh, Hernandez, uh, a leading uh, uh, advocate of this uh, this argument was Justice Kennedy, it seemed. He called this an extraordinary case to be extended to uh, to extend Bivens to. He said that if there is indeed a problem at the border, then it seems it would be a very sensitive matter of foreign affairs. <clears throat> Add to it that they haven't extended Bivens in roughly 30 years or so. And he, as far as I can tell, he was very, very uh, hesitant to uh, extend Bivens to, to, the, to the case here. So uh, that's sort of how, how I uh, uh, saw things come out. I'll, I'll go over some possible outcomes here. Obviously, you know, the usual thing is if it's four to four, then uh, in this case, the, the Fifth Circuit case would stand, or the t- decision would stand uh, without a nationwide precedent. precedent. But uh, I believe uh, uh, Amy Howe over at SCOTUS Block had a very good post about this uh, the day after the or- or argument. She brought the possibility that if there's a 4 4 tie, <clears throat> they might wait until Judge Gorsuch is, uh, um, if and when he is confirmed, and then rehear the case uh, this fall. One issue I wanted to bring up about a 4-4 tie, if they do release a 4-4 tie opinion, is that there is a uh, case pending in the Ninth Circuit right now called uh, Rodriguez v. Swartz, or I guess Swartz v. Rodriguez. It is out of Arizona. Uh, It is a very similar fact pattern. Uh, the difference is, I guess, that uh, there is no, you know, con- concrete culvert or anything like that. The, the victim in that uh, in that case was just standing on a sidewalk uh, across from Nogales, Arizona, in the in uh, in Mexico, and the federal agent in that case was uh, charged with murder and is is currently being charged with murder. Uh, the questions are very similar at the Ninth Circuit. The district court in Arizona came to uh, almost a polar opposite uh, conclusion that the Fifth Circuit did. So <clears throat> if they were to release a 4-4 tie, and, uh, oh, I should say that the Ninth Circuit had oral arguments in that case last October, uh, and if, uh, has been, uh, as far as I can, can tell, just sitting on their opinion waiting for guidance from the Supreme Court. And so presumably if they issue a 4-4 tie, the Ninth Circuit could uh, release their, could and would probably release their opinion. If it's at odds with the Fifth Circuit, we would have a, a clean circuit split on the issue and, and be right back up. So if I had to guess, um, um, uh, I think that, especially the Bivens issue being be a cl- pretty clear split, as far as I can tell, that the Supreme Court is probably going to be hearing this case again in one form or, form or another. Thank you for listening to this episode of SCOTUS Cast. For more episodes of SCOTUS Cast, as well as audio and video of past Federalist Society events, please visit our website at www.fedsoc.org/multimedia.